How's everyone going? So uh, it is my first time in Sydney. It has been awesome. Um, so in last week, um, I've been spending time with a bunch of the startups here in the city, everything from um, Atlassian and Canva. I've been hanging out with the Blackbird folks. Um, it's been really fun. Um, so thank you for, for welcoming me. And uh, it's awesome to see this great group of people uh, brought together. So today I want to talk about um, you know, something that I think all of us in technology, in, in the shared global culture, we just have this like obsession with what's next, right? And you can see that um, you know, when you have dinner in, in San Francisco with somebody who's been super successful, they've, they've sold their company, and you know, once you kind of bask in the glory of that a little bit, everyone just asks you, what are you, what are you doing next? What's next? And so the same thing happens when it comes to growth, right? That, this is one of the most common questions that people ask me, which is, you know, what's next in the industry? What are the next big opportunities that all of us can be part of? And so there's a couple things I want to talk about today, which is, you know, I think you have to really zoom out and talk, think about like, the history of what's come before us and really start to connect the dots. So, so that's what I'm going to do today. Because when you look at what technology is, has, has evolved over the last 100 years, you see some really remarkable things. So this graph is the, uh, the, the y-axis here is, um, is the penetration of US households. And these are all these different technologies over, over the years. And what you see is over on the left side, there's the telephone, the car, the t stove, the refrigerator. These are technologies that actually took not five years or 10 years, but actually have taken 20, 30, 40, 50 years to penetrate the majority of US households. Amazing, right? And you can see this clothes, clothes washer. I think we're still like, working on that one. Um, but when you look at the internet and you look at the smartphone, what you see is that these are technologies that are emerging so quickly and they're spreading so fast that in a smaller span of than, than 10 years, they're penetrating. And if we could put Instagram up here, if we could put WhatsApp, if we could put Uber up here, you would see a straight line up to the top, right? And so it's a remarkable time to be working in technology, to be working in marketing, because you can just see how fast everything's evolving. It's creating some really incredible opportunities for all of us. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk through three little stories of you know, different kind of marketing, growth, technology um, you know, phenomenon that's, that's happened you know, over 100 years ago and connect with technology that's happening today. And I think what that'll do is that'll offer some clues on where the whole industry is going, where growth is going. It's going to be great. So I'm going to publish a copy of this deck on my blog, so this is where you can find it. The first thing, let's talk about getting customers to refer friends. Now, this is like one of the most scalable, really, really important strategies out there. And it's really simple, right? If you can get people, if you can get your customers to refer their friends, and they go on to refer more friends, well, this just goes on and on and on. And so this scales. So some of the very important, successful, huge companies out there, Dropbox, Airbnb, Facebook, et cetera, have all spread this way. And, and what you have to do is you have to answer some really fundamental questions. You know, why are people referring their friends who are they referring? Are they referring coworkers, their families, you know, their acquaintances? Where, you know, what's actually happening? And what channel is this happening on, right? Um, are the invites happening via snail mail, which we're going to talk about? Or, or are they being shared as links over Facebook, which we'll also talk about? And then finally, you have to think about, you know, is this whole effort, is it going exponential? What's the viral factor? You know, what, what's actually going on? And, and although these are things that obviously all of us in the industry, we think about and work on every day. The interesting part is that this has been around for a really long time. How long? This is one of the first chain letters that we have a photo of. And it's called the Prosperity Club. And in it, this is just so great, I just love reading these. So this chain was started in hope of bringing prosperity to you. Within three days, why three days? It's just, you know, just cause. Make five copies of this letter and send it to your friends. Right? And what ends up happening is, uh, you know, and there's some extra instructions on how after you've done all of this, you'll then receive over time 15,000 letters with money attached to them. Sounds amazing, right? 
But when you look at this, you can just feel, even though this is 100 years old, that somebody, a very smart copywriter, had to think about, okay, well, you know, you've got to give them three days, you've got to have some instructions, there's got to be a value proposition, right? And when you look at this, this, this is being sent over snail mail, so it's really slow, right? But these worked. They worked so well, in fact, that the U.S. Postal Office had to ban chain letters because it was literally clogging up all their mail. It was like crazy, because people like, loved these things. And you can look at this, and you can look at something like the Airbnb referral page, and you can see that, yes, over 100 years, we've made a lot of advancements, right? You have a unique tracking URL, so you can figure out, um, you know, you can do all the attribution. You can share on Messenger, you can share on Facebook. You can grab this link, you can put it, you know, anywhere you want, right? But the fundamentals are still the same. You want to do this because not only do you get something for it, but your friends do as well. Now, this, of course, focuses on money. This is the Dropbox example, which they've used to now grow to over 400 million users. And I'm an advisor to the company, um, you know, great folks. And again, same thing here. You, know, you can import your Gmail contacts, you can share on Facebook. It's all the same ideas. Like These same concepts that worked 100 years ago, they are working today, right? Different technologies, but fundamentally, it's all about the same human behavior. I'm going to talk about the, a second little story, which is spreading viral content. This is something that's you know, very timely right now, as you might imagine. So in the early 1800s, they invented this thing called the penny press, which was a set of newspapers that you could actually buy for one penny, and it was enabled by a brand new technology that created a dramatic, incredible shift in costs, which was the steam-powered printing press. And so you can now create newspapers, sell them for a penny, before you know, it was, everything was like 10 times more expensive. And so this revolutionized news and media at the time, because what it meant, all of a sudden, news wasn't just something that could be consumed by the elite. It was something that everybody all the way down to the middle class, lower class, could start to read news and what was actually happening, right? It was a radical transformation of media. Starting to sound a little similar, maybe. While I was researching this deck, I found this really great quote, I just have to share it with you guys. Which is, when a dog bites a man, that's not news, because it happens so often. But if a man bites a dog, that is news. So, <laughs> this is the, uh, uh, quite the philosophy and, uh, at the time. And, uh, and so the Sun was one of the preeminent penny press um, companies at the time. The other one was the New York Daily Times, which again, over 100 years, has become the New York Times. So this is a you know, super, super interesting area. So let's say you run one of these media properties, and it's really important to you to, to grow your circulation, to grow your business. So what do you do? Well, there's a great example. The Sun ended up publishing a six-part essay series called The Great Astronomical Discoveries Lately Made by Sir John Herschel. And it chronicled how an astronomer had built an amazing, powerful telescope and pointed it at the moon. And on the moon, they discovered unicorns. They discovered bison. They discovered people, whole civilization, with people with wings flying around. Amazing. And it was hugely successful. It doubled circulation. It was something that was copied into pamphlets. All their competitors started copying these ideas. Everybody started printing this story over and over and over again. And of course, this whole episode, the six-part series, was eventually renamed to the Great Moon Hoax of 1835, <laughs> which is very silly. Um, and what's amazing is that people fundamentally, the reason why this all worked was because of the fact that people fundamentally believed that this was actually true was actually true. They actually had discovered life on, on the moon. And they wanted to believe, and so they talked about it, and they bought all the stories, and they read it, and they thought it was news. And on one hand, that's ridiculous, completely ridiculous. But of course, this is where we are now, 100 years later. In fact, things are so bad. Uh, this was published on, on Twitter um, a little while ago, or sorry, on Facebook, where in Mark, Mark Zuckerberg's update on how he was going to handle all the fake news on, on Facebook, look to the right. You, know, you have uh, 
Tiger Woods looking like he's going to leave the PGA, <laughs> right? Supposedly published by ESPN. Also, CNN reporting that Congress has decided to disqualify Donald Trump. Not true. <laughs> Neither are true. So, where we are now, though, is we have used the same human behaviors, but now we can actually A-B test these fake news headlines. We can build landing pages with really sophisticated analytics. We can you know, add these little widgets that capture you know, people's uh, sharing intent better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've, we've supercharged this, right? We've supercharged this behavior that has already existed, except that we amplify it to an audience of a billion daily users, right? Crazy, powerful, super powerful. Let's talk about bootstrapping marketplaces. So marketplaces often have the same structure, which is you have a buy side, you have a sell side, and you have to figure out how to connect them. You have to figure out which side is constrained. How do you grow the buy side? How do you grow the sell side? Right? Whichever side is more constrained, you have to put your focus there. And then you have to bring people together in such a way that they can find each other, they can find safe prices, they can transact. Right? Grocery stores used to be a key part of this kind of marketplace. And the reason was because in, in the early days of, of consumer packaged goods, these grocery stores would not actually stock your product because they would say, look, people aren't coming into the grocery store asking me for toothpaste, right? So why would I, why would I actually stock it? And on the flip side, of course, nobody knows what toothpaste is, so what do you do? There's a great book, this guy named Claude Hopkins who, who wrote in 1905, a book called My Life in Advertising, and he talks about everything that he did in order to popularize toothpaste in America, right? And he had such a clever strategy. There's a couple things I wanna, I wanna note here. Number one, this is a long form style, medium style post, right? With, with a bunch of content on there. The second thing is that on the bottom right is a coupon. So Claude actually invented coupons, believe it or not. Super interesting. And what he did was he basically said, look, if I create an incentive for you to get toothpaste, then what's gonna happen is, as a customer, you're gonna start going to all of these grocery stores and you start asking for toothpaste, right? And so you go to all the grocery stores, so he, he ended up going to the grocery stores and saying, look, you're about to get a flood of customers in here and they're gonna be asking for toothpaste and if you don't have it, they're gonna be upset, they're gonna go to another grocery store, right? And so he figured out how to do this bootstrapping process of how do you deal with, you know, how do you go zero to one on a new, on a new product in a new marketplace that requires you to figure out either the buy side or the sell side, and, and, and he figured it out. The other thing I want to just quickly mention here, because there's so many, so the book is actually amazing, I, I definitely recommend it, is you can't quite see it, but on the, the, the top right of the coupon, there's actually a number, it's like 1063. So that was actually a tracking number, so when people clipped that coupon and sent it in, he could do attribution, right? Pretty cool, right? And then he actually would start doing different versions of this ad in different magazines and different newspapers and track the attribution, and then he could actually figure out, he could actually start A-B testing, you know. So anyway, so these ideas are old. I flew from San Francisco, so this, this, was, this was the screenshot that most excited me. Um, so Kickstarter, of course, is, is a marketplace that is solving exactly the same problems, which is you have an idea, you want to get it out there, right? And so, of course, as soon as you do, then the great part about it is you can aggregate all the buyers because you give them discounts. You say, if you're one of the first 100 backers, you get $10, $10 off, right? If you're the first 500, you get more off. And so they can start aggregating all this demand so that then they can then go to investors, to retailers, to the manufacturers, and they can get these things built and sold. And so now we've seen a bunch of really interesting companies like Pebble, you know, which uh, was a Y Combinator company, had a really hard time raising capital and they used Kickstarter to then be able to, you know, break this logjam. Really great. So obviously, we could go, we could talk about a bunch of these examples. There's actually some really great ones. Uh, the other ones I'll just quickly mention, you know, the Michelin Guide being created by uh, the Michelin Tire Company, right? So early kind of content marketing, trying to convince people like, hey, you should drive around and like, you know, visit a bunch of places, that's super interesting. A lot of examples in early Hollywood of influencer marketing, right? And the reason why these things have been around for such a long time is because 
you know, we've been trying to convince people to buy stuff for a really long time, right? But the central point that I want to make is that technology changes, but people stay the same. And we work in an industry that is, of course, obsessed with technology, right? But at the same time, and this is one of the great things about working in growth, working in marketing, is that we sort of bridge the two sides, both the sort of classic human behavior, human psychology aspects that are part of our, our brains that have evolved over the you know, last million, millions of years, but also technology, which is just evolving super, super quickly. And so what that means is that when it comes to all the strategies that we've talked about through the course of this conference, referrals, virality, publicity stunts, A-B testing, all that stuff, you know, these things were all created like 100 plus years ago, but they're relevant today. They're relevant, they'll be relevant 100 years from now. They'll be relevant 1,000 years from now. Like, this stuff is, is just going to be around. And so, going back to the original question, what's next for growth? Well, these opportunities are happening all the time. And the reason is because these classic strategies that tie into human behavior, that tie into human psychology, well, they're just going to be around forever, right? And the things that we can control as folks that are working in, in the industry, number one, is thinking about and embracing new platforms. And there are a bunch of new platforms coming out. I'm, I'm going to run through a couple of them. And of course, as all of us, to execute intelligently and diligently to make this work. But it is an incredible time to be in technology. Why is that? We're building new kinds of computer companies all the time, right? for the first time in a long time. Like, you know, we have internet-connected home. We have computers on your face. We have a whole new set of platforms that are coming around video. More computers on your face. And it's funny, you know, because I'm, I'm actually, I have an HTC Vive, and I have it set up in my living room, and, I'm, and, and I like to use it. And it's interesting because we're, we're both so excited about VR technology and AR technology, but at the same time, the next level of discussion hasn't even happened yet, right? How is customer acquisition going to work in VR, right? Is it going to, like, does, does pay-per-click, does that make sense? Does pay-per-install make sense, right? That next level of conversation hasn't happened yet, and I think for the folks that really dive into it and really figure it out, it's going to be, it's going to be really big. Smart TV, wearables, self-driving. Another really interesting area, because imagine creating a class of companies that has just assumed transportation is free, right? It's going to fundamentally revolutionize retail, e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera. And these platforms, these are all new kinds of computer companies that are happening. And going back to this graph, the amazing thing about it is they're just coming faster. They're coming faster and faster and faster, and they're hitting 100% penetration in, in ways that we've never seen. And so for all of us that work in the industry, I have a couple of things that I want to ask. You know, my challenge to all of you is, first and foremost, to study the classics. How have marketers been persuading customers to buy stuff for hundreds of years, right? Because those, those same techniques still fundamentally work. We need to have a really systematic way of thinking through all these new platforms that are coming out, because that's going to be you know, the big new thing. Imagine understanding the dynamics of the internet before the internet came out, or understanding what the mobile ecosystem was going to look like before the smartphone got popular. Right? When you're the first to one of these things, well, that's when all the response rates are going to be higher. That's when it's going to be the least competitive. And so when you're first to the game, that's where a lot of the really great opportunities are. And so what that means is, really, we have to think like technology companies. We have to understand you know, what are the APIs that we can hook into, what are the ecosystems that are out there, and really like, think ahead. And then obviously, to execute thoughtfully and iteratively on here. And the important part is, you know, that's why these kinds of conferences exist, right? Because you know, fundamentally, there are, there, there's such a breadth of different concepts, different strategies, different things out there. There's just so much noise. And so 
I think that's a really key component here, which is that there's so many, there's such a desire for companies to just publish kind of all their like tips and tricks. Hey, by the way, if you turn these buttons orange, you'll get, you know, an X percent increase. And I think one of the interesting parts like, you know, that people ask me all the time is they will often come up to me and say, hey, um, what are the newest like tips and tricks, right? They, they always want the easy, right? But I think the, the most interesting part about this whole industry is that actually all the things that work have worked a long time ago. And the innovations come from getting close to the technology in a way that, you know, is like hard, right? It's about, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick example, you know, so for example, the, um, the Facebook platform when it first came out. All the folks that were able to build the, the apps that grew to tens of millions of DAU, my friends that were PMs and folks that were, that were working on this stuff, well, you know, they were taking a lot of these kind of classic, you know, human psychology ideas. They were looking at reciprocity. They were looking at people who, wanting to compare each other, sending quizzes, like all of these different ideas that, again, have been around for a really long time. But then they were combining that with actually reading through the Facebook platform APIs, right? They were really getting in there and trying to figure out like, okay, how do I master this new channel, this new platform that's actually come out? And so they went on to then figure out like, okay, great, how do you use Open Graph? Like, how do you use, um, you know, how do you use all these different viral channels that are out there? That's really important. Because like I said, technology changes and people stay the same. <laughs> so I found this photo of, uh, of these guys taking selfies. And, and I was pondering if I wanted to use this uh, set of tourists taking selfies. Or there's actually a really great one where Obama actually has a, has a selfie stick and he's like posing and taking, taking a couple. So it was, it, I, was gonna, I was gonna use that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's why you know, when it comes to you know, investing and identifying the startups that are gonna be the most successful. Um, and I worked in venture capital you know, pr prior to Uber. One of the first things that we would think about is, you know, wh what are all the pre-existing behaviors that indicate that this is going to happen, right? And if you take Uber as a great, great example of this, you know, all it's doing is it's taking something that is really low on the Maslow's hierarchy, right? You need food, you need water, you need a place to live, but as soon as you have those basic things, you need transportation, right? You need to get to your job, you need to get groceries, you need to be able to, you know, hang out with your family. And so by making that a lot easier, like you could, you could imagine how, you know, taxis already existed, like that behavior already existed, and you just, all you do is you figure that out, and then you study, okay, how does technology sort of, you know, make that even easier? And I think this is like a good rule of thumb when it comes to consumer technology, because, you know, fundamentally, humans have just been, been the same for such a long time. And so we have to study humans, right? Which is so funny, because again, all of us are so obsessed with tech, you know, in engineering, and we have such a, you know, sort of businessy mindset towards all this stuff, when at the end it's the human behavior and personality that really makes us work. Thank you. <laughs>